Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's event. I would like to begin by acknowledging that St. of X is located in Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. This territory is covered by the Treaties of Peace and Friendship, which Mi'kmaq and Maliseet peoples first signed with the British Crown in 1725. Before colonization, Indigenous people were much more fluid in their gender and sexuality. As a treaty people, it is our obligation to recognize the role of gender and sexuality in the dismantling of oppressive systems, as well as our collective efforts towards decolonization. I'd like to thank everybody for attending this evening and introduce our director and curator of the St. of X Art Gallery, Andrea Terry. The exhibition that is unfolding now on the Art Gallery's social media pages, soon to be on its website, and then projected in large screen format in the gallery itself starting February 2nd, is entitled Legacies, the Pride of Nova Scotia. And it features a really exciting range of artworks represented in digital photographs and featured on the multiple, in the multiple venues I mentioned. Submitted by 22 artists in and from Nova Scotia, the art showcases the achievements, talents, experiences, and strengths of 2S LGBTQIA plus people. And I'd like to recognize, name, and thank each of the contributing artists. They are Sarah Avmat, Michael Boddy, Catherine Boucher, Shelby Donald, and those artists' works now appear on the gallery's Instagram and Facebook pages, as well as those of X Pride Society. Forthcoming artists to be featured are Lev Easterly, Brant Eisner, Chris Fraser, Arun Lal, Taylor Linloff, David Macaskill, Kaylee McDonald Lyons, Allison McLennan, Shauna McLeod, Miles McPherson, Thomas Malong, Andrew Murray, Parker Poole, Andrew Kwan, Liam Ross, Sydney Sparrow, and Greg Stearns. And I'd like to thank each of you personally because without you, this show would not be happening. In the fall of 2021, St. FX Gender and Sexual Diversity Advisor, Amy McDonald, who gave the land acknowledgement, began planning with the X Pride Society, an executive team of student volunteers. Together, they began planning a range of events for January 2022nd, which is Pride Month at St. FX. Pride Month, McDonald's writes, is, quote, a month-long celebration of individuality and the right to be who you are. It stands to fight against discrimination and violence towards 2S LGBTQIA plus people. Pride Month also seeks to promote individual self-affirmation, dignity, equality rights, increase their visibility as a social group, build community, and celebrate sexual diversity and gender variance. Unquote. To help further this work, the St. FX Art Gallery has partnered with the X Pride Society and co organized this exhibition. And tonight, Amy and I are very pleased to present Curating Queerly, a special talk by Robin Metcalf as part of the Legacies exhibition. Robin Metcalf is a Canadian writer, curator, and queer community historian of Acadian and Newfoundland ancestry. He has been an activist around 2S LGBTQIA plus issues in the Maritimes, nationally and internationally since the mid 1970s. His art writing, fiction, poetry, and essays have appeared in over 65 magazines and 15 anthologies and been translated into French, Japanese, Mi'kmaq, Spanish, and Swedish. His exhibitions include Queer Looking, Queer Acting, Lesbian and Gay Vernacular on at the MSVU Art Gallery 1997 and remounted in 2014. Campfires, the queer Baroque of Leopold L. Fulem, Paul Mathieu and Richard Millet on at the Gardner Museum in 2014, which then toured to Montreal, Halifax and Bellevue, Washington. And Miguel de Damon, do you remember? featuring the art of Ursula Johnson, which toured across Canada 2014 to 2019. He was the director curator of the St. Mary's University Art Gallery 2004 to 2020, 
and Curator of Contemporary Art at Museum London in Ontario, 2001 to 2004. In 2010, Halifax Pride named him Honorary Grand Marshal. In his talk tonight, Robin will be talking about curating exhibitions as a queer activist practice, including organizing in the 1970s and 80s, the first exhibitions in Atlantic Canada of art from queer communities. With examples from his own extensive history of exhibitions and publications, including work with trans and two-spirited Indigenous artists, he will describe a professional curatorial practice that is rooted in community engagement and a commitment to intersectional social change. And with that, I'd like to turn the virtual floor over to Robin. Well, thank you very much, Andrea and Amy. Merci beaucoup, um, Wellario. Um, I'm speaking to you tonight from Sheet Harbor Passage, which is close to Oweijwik in Eskegewigik District in Mi'kmaq. Um, I'd also like to say how honored I am to be associated with this exhibition. I uh, had a look at some of the works that have been uh, put forward, and it uh, looks like a very interesting show. There's a number of artists that I'm familiar with in it, and I'd like to acknowledge some of them. Uh, specifically, I know um, uh, 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 Sarah Avmat, I've known for many years, Grant Ice. Chris Fraser, of course, um, and Arjun Lal, who I believe is in our audience tonight, who actually designed the banner that is here behind me, uh, which there's a version of that as well in uh, the Halifax Airport. He's last time I was in Halifax Airport, which is a while ago. Um, and I'd also like to give a shout out to Carl Stewart, who is watching today from Ottawa, I believe. Now, I'm going to share uh, my screen and see that if this works okay. Um, there we go. Um, so, uh, as um, has been noted already, I am of mixed Acadian and Newfoundland ancestry, and this is a picture of me with uh, uh, what my friend Josie Mills calls one of my diminutive Acadian ancestors here at uh, Grand Pré. Um, and, um, uh, I think it's, for me it's important to, to be, uh, to acknowledge uh, my uh, ancestry here in Atlantic Canada, my settler ancestry on my father's side from Newfoundland, my mother's side, which is Acadian, and of course the Acadians have a very important uh, long-standing relationship with the Mi'kmaq people to whom we owe, many, to some extent, our very existence, uh, as Mi'kmaq support allowed us to survive the Grand Delangement of 1755. And again, I say, well, in this time, to the uh, Mi'kmaq people. Um, I've had a bit of a crazy day, so uh, uh, and I'd like to thank Andrea for helping me um, uh, with a little bit of a venting <laughs> earlier today. Um, uh, so I'll try to keep this as focused as possible. Um, this is also just uh, an image of me with my mother and my aunt down in um, uh, Bay Saint Marie in Clare, uh, which is the kind of now the Acadian uh, homeland, largest Acadian community in uh, Nova Scotia. And you see one of the names there is Como, my mother is Como, and uh, also Lebanon. I'm as much Lebanon as Como. So um, I am, uh, an, we might say, an accidental uh, curator, um, and uh, or, which also means I'm an activist curator. Uh, I didn't actually set out to become a visual arts curator, but I, um, it, it grew out of my activist practice. In 1974, I went to NASCAD for, and I completed one year there. I had just come out uh, and uh, thought that, oh, an art college would be a good place to go to be gay. And was I ever wrong? Um, the art college in Halifax at that time was probably one of the least queer art colleges in the country um, for specific historical reasons. And it's odd because Halifax as a city is a very queer city. It's always had a really large um, uh, uh, queer community. Um, but uh, there was not a lot of overlap between, in most of the years that I was active, have been active in Halifax, between the queer community and the art community that was centered around NASCAD. So I, um, uh, I mean, I completed one year at NASCAD and did not go back after that first year. Um, instead, I did two things. I started working on the railroad as the sleeping car port, and I um, uh, uh, and I got very involved in queer politics. Uh, this I worked uh, on the railroad as a sleeping car porter for 10 years, from 1975 to 1985, going back and forth between Halifax and Montreal. And I have to say that after leaving NASCAD and going to the railroad, the railroad was vastly queerer than NASCAD. 
It was a very queer workplace, a very diverse workplace. I was very fortunate that I worked there in the last period of time in which there was a really substantial um, uh, onboard uh, culture of uh, African Nova Scotian men. Um, uh, traditionally, railway porters had all been black in North America up until uh, in Canada until 1963, when uh, the railroads were desegregated as workplaces. And so as a consequence, when I started working there, which was 12 years after desegregation in 1975 and six months after women started being hired uh, as railway porters, all of the senior porters and the sleeping car conductors to whom we reported were black and they were mostly from old Nova Scotian, African Nova Scotian families. So I was able to sit at lunch and supper and listen to stories about uh, the many struggles and the survival tactics and strategies of African Nova Scotians from a community of, of, of men who had represented a very proud tradition within that community. So um, I got very, I plunged into, the other thing I did is I plunged into queer politics. Um, uh, and uh, this is an image from the first um, uh, LGBTQIA plus uh, demonstration in Atlantic Canada in 1977 in February in front of the CBC radio building. Um, and that woman with the placard is Marianne Mancini, who we very sadly lost uh, with, within the last couple of years, uh, but incredibly uh, vital person who made an important contribution through the Gay Alliance for Equality in Halifax. Um, and one of the really notable things about the Gay Alliance for Equality is that it controlled the chief, main social space for the city of Halifax. This is the, and from back for much of Atlantic, Atlantic Canada. Um, this building on Barrington Street, which is still standing, uh, and there is an important group which is working to save the building and turn it back into a queer and cultural center. Um, we, the, we had the top, the Gay Alliance for Equality had the top floor of the building for many years, and we ran a club there called The Turret. Um, the name of the club is for an obvious reason, if you see the, the turret there in the building. And I think, yeah, there's my next uh, slogan, which is a logo designed by Rand Gaynor, who uh, is a graphic designer and uh, who's also taken some historically important photographs. And uh, the turret was very important because it was, uh, it, we were coming out of a period then when social spaces in uh, North America, queer social spaces, were often controlled by organized crime and almost always by um, heterosexuals. And in our case, we had an activist, political, community-based organization with a very diverse uh, membership um, that controlled the the main social space, not only for the city, but it was uh, uh, really a gathering spot for people from all over Atlantic Canada. Um, and uh, the other, th another thing I did in this time is I started writing for the body politic, which was the leading gay and lesbian journal at the time in Canada. And my terminology will go back and forth a bit because, of course, at that time we did not use terms like 2SLGBTQIA+, or even yet. Um, LGBT yet at that point we were it was a gay liberation uh, journal uh, um, and it uh, and we were learning to include to say lesbian and gay instead of just to say gay um, so every decade there is another or, or so there's a fresh wave of reimagining uh, and re-understanding of uh, what identities we're organizing under but if I use terms like gay and lesbian or gay liberation it's, it reflects the period uh, to which I'm referring the Body Politic was not only the most important journal in Canada, but it was actually in some ways the most important journal in the world for gay liberation. Um, if you were um, a progressive um, uh, queer activist in uh, Buenos Aires, in Amsterdam, uh, in Thailand, if you read an international paper, probably the first one you would read would be The Body Politic. So it was where a lot of political uh, conversations took place. And a lot of the struggle too was to, uh, there were a lot of, um, uh, there were very different terminology at the time, but many of the same issues. We didn't have the term intersectional, but I'd say that um, uh, intersectional, what we now call intersectional understandings were, were being pl placed on our agenda, often by challenges from people of underrepresented communities. Um, and and um, uh, so the, you can see in this image, which is from a, an event that happened at the turret, which was a fundraiser for the body politic. The body politic um, fought, uh, was charged, the officers of the body politic were charged for using the Canadian postal system to uh, transmit uh, immoral, indecent, or scurrilous material. So we all got to know what the word scurrilous meant. Um, and these were fr dear friends of mine, and they were facing possibly five year prison sentences for 
for publishing um, uh, a gay liberation journal. Um, one of the results of this is this is one of my early cultural queer activist acts. Um, uh, in 1979, the body politic was um, uh, acquitted for the first time in a series of three trials. It was acquitted each time, but the, the, it was tried again and again and again uh, in an attempt to drive, the, to exhaust their finances and exhaust their mo morale, pardon me. But the very first uh, acquittal of the body politic happened on February 14th, 1989. And I uh, came up with an idea which I put to the Gay Alliance for Equality, which uh, the GAE passed unanimously and delegated me as their delegate, as their representative at the National Canadian Conference happening in Ottawa that summer to bring this, um, uh, this uh, resolution forward where it was also passed unanimously. And it was to declare a uh, gay and lesbian national holiday and I will just read you the um, uh, the resolution and I would note that censorship is, uh, during that period was really an extremely important uh, area of struggle because we before we could do anything before we could communicate with each other make our existence visible organize um, uh, advertise meetings or events or demonstrations we had to overcome the overwhelming uh, censorship that was uh, prevailing in the media um, uh, so this is the resolution. We recognize the importance of making known our history, so much of which has been lost or stolen, and particularly of commemorating the victories of lesbians and gay men. Given the historic importance of the acquittal of the officers of Pink Triangle Press, which was the group who published the body politic, it was a nonprofit um, collective, um, as the first major legal victory for the Canadian gay movement, and given the fortuitous date of that victory, we propose a yearly celebration to mark the day. We realize that this date, February 14th, has traditionally been celebrated as St. Valentine's Day and dedicated to the expression of heterosexual affection. We take this opportunity to challenge what Christopher Isherwood has called the heterosexual dictatorship by affirming for ourselves and the world the existence, the strength, and the beauty of gay love. A central image, a central symbol of St. Valentine's Day has been the figure of Cupid derived from the ancient Greek Eros. We intend to make this day a celebration of the liberation of Eros, both as a reality in our personal lives since coming out and as a common political goal to be achieved. We therefore proclaim February 14th as an annual Canadian gay holiday to be known as Pink Triangle Day. And this poster um, is one from, um, uh, just want to check, uh, this one is from 1996 and was designed by Chris O'Coin, who I believe is in the audience tonight and remains active in Halifax. Um, and he has incorporated the pink and the black triangle. And I won't go into a long history on this at the moment, but the pink triangle, if you're not familiar with it, was used in the Nazi concentration camps to mark homosexual men male prisoners. The black triangle was used for people who were grouped as called antisocial or asocial and it included um, uh, women who um, uh, may have been identified as lesbian and other people who may have been gender non-conforming. Um, this is uh, the first pink triangle uh, button, which is from uh, an event at the um, um, at the turret, a social event. And this was designed by Robert Gertel, another uh, designer who designed the newsletter for the GAE um, often. And um, and this is the interior of the turret. And the uh, these people are all standing here uh, the, on the occasion of the uh, 1978. Halifax Conference, uh, which was the, the national conference held in Halifax over a six-day period. Um, Georgina Chambers and I each together co-coordinated the conference, and there's people from pardon me, from across Canada in this image. Um, and you can see the interior of the turret, which was really kind of a charmed space. Um, now, as part of this conference, we did a lot of cultural activities. We also had a demo. It's the first on the street demo, as opposed to on the sidewalk. First time we claimed the streets for ourselves. I poured rain that day, but this was in summer 1978 and uh, was the march that was organized as part of the conference. And that photo is by Ann Fulton, who will come up again. And uh, this is a photo by Jerry Gerald Hannon, uh, and the person in the middle there is Tommy Miller, who was for many years the leading drag mother in Halifax and uh, has died within the last year, again, very sadly missed uh, individual, very important in the community. Uh, this is Ann Fulton here, who uh, was a very dear friend of mine. Um, we lost her a few years ago, I'm afraid. Um, uh, but she grew up in St. John, New Brunswick. She's here with an artwork 
and I don't have access to the name of the artist, but it was one of the works that was included in an exhibition that we uh, organized as part of the, co the uh, conference. Uh, we had a lot of uh, cultural activities as part of the conference, and um, uh, that uh, exhibition was, to my knowledge, the first uh, to us LGBTQIA themed exhibition in Atlantic Canada. This is summer 1978. And this is me and Anne. We had a little shtick that we would do where we, we, we would do little um, uh, political skits. And this one is uh, Sex Canada. Sex Canada, I was the receptionist for Sex Canada. And uh, she was a woman who was trying to get her, her um, Sex Canada registration card changed to lavender because she'd come out as a lesbian. And of course, I, as a bureaucrat, uh, presented all kinds of obstacles to her getting that done. Uh, so we performed this for the delegates at the 1978 conference. And this is me and my friend Jim McSwain, um, and uh, I'm wearing the pink triangle, and uh, Jim uh, was the person who basically organized the uh, 1978 exhibition uh, as part of the conference. And uh, a year later, this is a piece that he produced. Jim is still around. He's uh, active as an artist, a poet, uh, filmmaker, playwright uh, in Halifax. He won the Portia White Award a few years ago. And this is a, a piece he did, an agitprop art piece for an anti-censorship demonstration in 1979. We picketed the Ralston building where uh, Customs Canada was housed. And they're the basically the three monkeys, although they have little piggy noses. One of them is Canada Customs referring to the, uh, who had stopped a shipment of lesbian books headed for Halifax, CBC, which was refusing to carry public service announcements for gay organizations, and the Ontario Provincial Police, who were the ones who had uh, raided the body politic offices. And Jim and I worked together through the 1980s. We did a series of exhibitions uh, called Art by Gay Men. And um, this is, uh, I believe that Jim uh, may have uh, probably designed this poster, which is the first one that I have a copy of for the Art by Gay Men show, although it's the second, uh, uh, the second exhibition. But these are some images, very poor quality, but of the very first Art by Gay Men show at the Center for Art Tapes. And I will note that this Artist Run Center was the first cultural institution in Halifax that um, um, uh, made space in its program programming for openly queer programming. And you can see there Jim, that is Jim standing near his seven foot plywood penis, um, uh, which uh, was part of a video art piece and performance piece he did. And uh, this is, um, we had video as part of the uh, works that were in that show. Um, and in the, the second uh, iteration of the show, Travel to Fredericton, and uh, the tall man with the backpack in the center of the image is Greg White, who grew up in Newfoundland and in Dartmouth, and then ended up in Toronto, where he died as in, through, in the first big wave of deaths from the AIDS um, uh, epidemic, very sadly. He, was, he um, uh, was first an artist exhibiting an art by gay men, and then he worked with me and Jim in organizing one of the exhibitions. So we had set it up in a classroom there in Fredericton as part of an Atlantic regional lesbian and gay conference. And you can see we're making do with very limited spaces um, uh, to create the very first spaces uh, for uh, out queer uh, representations. Uh, we got a little more polished as we went on. This is a card that I designed in 19, for 1985 exhibition. And uh, it's, there's a map of Halifax here with a pink triangle superimposed over an area which is actually known as, or was known at the time as, the Triangle, which was the main gay male cruising area for the city. So there's an in-joke there with the two types of triangles. Um, this is me and Jim and two of the artists who were involved in the very first Art by Gay Men show at the Center for Art Tapes. And um, uh, then there's a, here's a, an invitation for the fourth exhibition. And I'm going to jump quickly through the 1990s. I was very busy in the 1990s, but I was. Uh, but this is me in 1991, I believe. Uh, this is uh, me in uh, Halifax Pride Parade. And um, uh, this is me with the artist Susan Took, who I think is also in our um, audience tonight. Hello, Susan. And uh, one of her works in the, at the opening of an exhibition called Subject Matter, which was the first really big contract I got as a freelance curator. What happened was that 1980, after 1985, when I left the railroad, I started uh, writing full time and uh, to set myself up as a freelance writer. I cashed in my 10 years worth of pension from the railroad so pardon me so that I could um, uh, have some capital to get myself started as an independent 
writer. And um, I was writing internationally for the gay press. Uh, I developed uh, connections through writing for the body politic. But uh, it gives you an idea of how poorly paid writing for the gay press was that I found I was making more money writing about visual art in Atlantic Canada, uh, which quickly became my, my main source of uh, income. And uh, writing about visual art led to invitations to um, uh, contribute essays for exhibition catalogs and then to curate exhibitions. Now, as you know, I was involved in organizing and curating exhibitions before uh, as part of an activist process, but I'd never thought that I was setting out to become a professional curator. I was doing it as a queer activist, and that was part of the cultural aspect of my queer activism. Uh, but it led to uh, important contracts, uh, such as this one for the Art Gallery of Nova Scotia. It was a big painting and sculpture show uh, in 1992. Um, uh, I am just... Uh, having trouble, oh, there we go. Uh, so I'm jumping forward now to the late 90s because um, uh, in the middle of the 1990s, at the same time as this picture was taken in 1992, I had a Canada Council um, B grant, uh, as they were called at the time, which allowed me to go to Europe and uh, visit some of the leading uh, the countries that had some of the most advanced queer communities like Holland and, um, and uh, Sweden and Denmark. And I ended that trip in Paris, attending the National Conference of the International Lesbian and Gay Association, or ILGA. And um, uh, so I was doing research into queer questions in visual culture at the time. I was actually doing research into the politics of the gay male body. And I always think it was a pretty good, good gig that I was able to get $17,000 to do research into the politics of the gay male body. But um, uh, I'd say that that research really, things started to come together at the in the late 90s in terms of doing professional exhibitions in in public galleries that uh, brought to, uh, it's in my concerns about queer visual culture and queer questions in visual culture. This is the logo for an exhibition called Queer Looking, Queer Acting, Lesbian and Gay Vernacular, which um, uh, took place at the Mount St. Vincent University Art Gallery in 1997. And I have to thank Ingrid Jenkner, the then director curator at the Mount, who uh, jumped at the at this proposal from me and made this exhibition possible. And um, I'll note that the the, the stretch fabric um, installation uh, uh, elements here were designed by um, uh, Christine Macy and Sarah Bunmaison, who are uh, a couple in life and a couple in, in their business. They, they do tensile structures and teach at the architecture school at Dalhousie, and they design the installation materials, the installation, physical um, uh, setup with these stretched fa uh, fabric pieces on which we attached uh, um, buttons. The show consisted of works that have been um, object, cultural objects that have been produced as part of queer activism. So there are posters, as you can see in the background, there are buttons, such as those that are on the stretched fabric. You can see Jim's um, uh, three men there off to the left, the, uh, the placards. Those are actually a reproduction because the originals had been destroyed uh, just by time, and uh, we commissioned Jim to create them again. And um, uh, so those are the, the uh, reproduction ones that he produced for the show. Um, there were a couple of objects that artists put in that were actually produced as art objects, but uh, except for two objects, basically all the things in the show were produced as ephemera. They were like things like t-shirts that people would wear, um, uh, buttons they they pin on the t-shirts, posters they'd put up, things that were there to articulate a queer presence in the world. Um, I included uh, things that were related to um, uh, perform anything performative, anything from like marching down the street in a, in a, in a demo or in a militant t-shirt to um, drag performances and uh, uh, various ways and that um, and some of the, the objects that people produce, the props that people produce to go along with drag performances. Um, this is another view but looking in the other direction. You can see that there's a large image there of the turret logo that's on Plexi and was actually um, on the wall in the turret in the years when it was um, operating. And in the lower left hand corner here, it's, um, uh, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but there's, a, a, that's um, a, 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 a scepter, there was, a, a, and above it is a tiara, uh, which were produced by um, Chuck Gillis, that was his, as an, his name, uh, his boy name, his drag name was Lulu LaRude, and Lulu was the leading drag performer at the time, really, she was really talented, uh, very, very funny, with a very cutting humor, um, uh, live performer, and uh, Lulu LaRude produced these for the show, and the, the piece, the two parts together are called the Crown Jewels of Corporate Greed, and this was produced during the AIDS crisis at a 
time when people, one of the only uh, uh, medications that was available to people with AIDS was AZT, which was quite toxic um, and was the source of a lot of profits to the, for, to the uh, for corporate pharmacies, pharma pharmaceutical industry. And this, uh, these um, objects are made out of $4,000 worth of expired AZT capsules. So they're actually made out of what had been medications, although they were past their best, their best before date, uh, a very pointed piece. Um, in the 1997, I also curated an exhibition at MSVU um, uh, of um, um, Mike McDonald, who was a uh, queer Mi'kmaq artist who worked mainly in video. And his work was um, uh, brought out again recently for um, uh, Nocturne a couple of years ago. And this was this is an advertisement for a panel uh, that was discussing his work. Um, uh, he, um, uh, he planted butterfly gardens, among other things. And so he engaged with issues around uh, um, uh, uh, ecology and indigenous understandings of uh, of the natural world. But Mike was, uh, yeah, I think it was also uh, a queer text was part of this for him as well. And there's a lot of queer uh, readings to the image of the butterfly, which is central to this work. Um, I did an, uh, one evening um, film and video screening called Big Hair uh, for the Center of Art Tapes, uh, I discovered that I became aware that a number of marginalized communities, particularly um, people of African descent, but also Indigenous people, um, feminists, and, uh, uh, and there are also um, people of Asian descent are represented here. Um, uh, for them, uh, hair has been a, a, a site of um, both conflict with prevailing notions of beauty um, and, uh, uh, and uh, lack of access to the resources necessary for care of, um, of hair, for example, of African hair. Um, uh, and, um, and of course, of resistance and, and of power for people. And there's incredible uh, vein of uh, humor running through these. Some of these are quite hilarious. But they're also these uh, films and videos, but they're also uh, very pointed and um, and bring it, bring it back to the body, the issues of what happens with racialized people and people and uh, with uh, anyone who feels out of sync with prevailing notions of gender. Um, uh, I did an exhibition in 1998 called uh, Dressing Down, which was artists working with um, uh, um, costume or clothing. And uh, there was quite a bit of queer present, uh, con uh, content in this show. Uh, in the far back wall, you can see a series of small black and white images by Aaron Anais Kimberly, uh, who um, uh, I haven't been in touch with uh, Aaron Anais Kimberly for a few years. I'm not sure how they identify. I'll, I'll use the pronoun they because I think they would probably, they, they, the way they were presenting themselves in today's terms would probably um, be genderqueer or non-binary. Um, but uh, Aaron Anais, uh, who was um, generally presenting as female, was here, uh, took uh, photographs of themselves in, uh, uh, in male drag and really quite interesting take on masculinity uh, in those images. Um, and in be here on in the right hand uh, side, you'll see some uh, gay tartans that were designed by Neil McInnes, who grew up around here and uh, who is active as a textile artist, which I know some of the people in the current exhibition of St. FX are. Um, uh, in the middle is a piece called Gorge by Glynis Humphrey. And uh, it's a size 66 women's strapless evening gown. She managed to consume all the bridal tull in Halifax that was available one May, uh, and weddings in June had a bit of a crisis in Halifax that year. Uh, but it really confronted people with the fee our culture's fear of the female body by making it making it overwhelming and enormous. It was interesting how the gen different gendered responses to the dress, um, with a lot of heterosexual men actually fleeing in terror from the object. I thought it was fabulous. Going, if you went up under the under the skirts, there was this incredible pink bell you could be inside. But um, some straight men didn't like being inside that pink bell. It uh, felt threatening to them. Um, and uh, this is a piece by Ruth Schuing, and it's, it's uh, for Rosie the Riveter. And she did, um, again, this is an over, oversized, but she took, I think, a simplicity pattern, sized it up and did it in, in uh, flashing. So it's in metal. Um, and it's a reference to Rosie the Riveter, the women who worked in industrial occupations after World, during World War II, and then after World War II were sent, uh, were, were pushed culturally back to the home and away from, uh, from paid labor, especially industrial paid labor. 
and in the side gallery of the show, this is at the Oakville Art Galleries in Ontario. This is Theresa Marshall's work. She's a Mi'kmaq artist from uh, from Numagi or Cape, Cape Breton, and uh, the piece in the center is called Bearing Straight Jacket, and she's made these jackets, which are uh, they're like um, business jackets, but they have uh, the kinds of arms that straight jackets have. And uh, you can see the farther one is decorated in traditional Mi'kmaq um, applique, and the interior. Uh, of the lining of each of the jackets is done in a fabric that's printed with the treaties, the text of the of the treaties of peace and friendship. And those uh, are also used on the uh, serpents that are these snakes that are made out of neckties that are on the hanging on the wall. So Teresa was uh, uh, one of the first indigenous artists I worked with who was um, uh, finding ways to um, uh, represent colonialism and uh, anti-indigenous racism and to make visible the history associated with that. Um, in I mentioned um, Ruth Schuing, who was the woman who did uh, Rosie the Riveter. Uh, Ruth Schuing is one of the editors of an anthology called Material Matters in the late 90s, and I wrote an essay for that on the work of Robert Windrum. My essay was called uh, Queer Stigmata, and this anthology is going to be republished this year. Uh, with that essay again. And this is um, Robert Windrum was working with um, uh, embroidery, as I know, uh, as I believe um, uh, Brant Eisner is as well in the current exhibition. And uh, uh, Robert Windrum was employing embroidery to do, to render motifs that were taken from tattooing. So there was a really interesting dialogue between the two different gendered um, traditions of making marks. One, embroidery, which is strongly embroidered, and now strongly gendered as feminine, and tattooing, which is strongly has been strongly gendered as masculine. Um, and this one's called Sorry Mom, it's kind of, kind of a, in very personal sense addresses immediately the conflict of a gay man who's into tattoos and embroidery. Um, and this is a piece that is called Homo, which the word Homo is on the tail of a shirt. And some of you may know the term shirtlifter, which is a British slang for gay men. And it's interesting that, of course, the word homo would be, would be, could be worn in or out. If you tuck your shirt in, uh, they wouldn't, people wouldn't see that word, uh, but they would see it if you left it out. In, uh, then I'm jumping ahead now. In 2001, I moved to London, Ontario, and uh, worked for three years as the curator of contemporary art at Museum London. And while I was there, I worked with the curator, independent curator, Anna Marie Larson, who was from Kitchener Waterloo, on a show uh, that she conceived of called Boys with Needles, which was four gay male artists working with textiles. This is work by Patrick Traer, um, which uh, bring together uh, some of the motifs of punching bags and of embroidery but also very clearly with reference to male genitalia. Um, um, and uh, again, queering uh, a series of, of references uh, that are highly sexual and embodied, and that, uh, but that uh, introduce elements that are contrary to the standard understanding of masculinity. Um, Anne Marie had, uh, her show had already been accepted by Museum London before I uh, started working there, and she was dismayed because she thought, oh, well, that's, that's a Robin show. That's a show that Robin would do. Like, here I'm, I'm doing it instead. But I was actually delighted to work with Anne Marie, and, and uh, I did contribute an essay to a catalog. Um, here's two more images from the show. At the far end, you'll see work, uh, which is um, Shakar Tapestry, that's done by uh, Neil McInnes, whom I mentioned earlier, who had done the Queer Tartans. And uh, uh, Neil was working with Shakar Looms in Montreal, and uh, he was working with the uh, image of Andrew Cunanan, who was the man who shot uh, Johnny Versace. And uh, um, you can see uh, uh, there's a, the sort of mix of images that are going on in the, in the uh, panels at the end of the um, uh, of the room. Um, while at Museum London, I also rehung the permanent collection, and I did it under the themes of body and nation. Uh, the hang had been a very conventional one, where all the works in the collection were hung. Basically, in chronological order, there was a room for all the uh, um, you know group of seven, and there was a room for all the artists from London who were active in the 60s and 70s, um, and who had been active around issues of Canadian identity. I uh, queered this in several ways. I mixed, jumbled the uh, the order, so things are from all different periods and forms of art, so they would, they would open up different uh, dialogues. And with Nation, I particularly wanted to, to uh, connect with work by Indigenous artists and, and put those up against uh, works like 
in our more conventional London uh, work produced by Londoners of settler ancestry around ideas of national identity. Um, and we had just acquired some really excellent work by contemporary Indigenous artists. You notice that some of the Walter Copper colored to well, which was playing off of some of the work of Carl Bean that we had in the collection. Um, but I was really proud of uh, the what I call the interior gallery or the, the body, the, the Titty Mom gallery, because it was all full of naked bodies. And um, in the middle of the image, in the back wall, it's a piece by um, um, the uh, uh, blank on his name now, London artist from the 1890s, um, who did a lot of sentimental images of children, which we now find difficult to deal with because they're also, we see them now highly sexualized in a way that they were not seen at the time that he did them. But that image is called the, the Modest Model. And um, you can see I've got other work uh, here. One of the other pieces in the room is this one by Atilla Richard Lukash, which is one of his very best pieces called The Young Spartans Challenge the Boys to Fight. And um, and so uh, it basically, I was, I was uh, trying to reintroduce a discomforting, uh, an uncomfortable uh, way of looking at um, uh, the artist whose name I'm blanking on now, um, uh, uh, and uh, uh, and putting in the same room with works like this one by Tilda Richard Lucas. I also got to bring out work by, there was a, cu a couple of artists named Loring and Wilde, who were a lesbian couple who were kind of, uh, uh, the, uh, their home was the social center for the art visual arts community, artist community in Toronto in the 1930s and 40s. And uh, this is a, a bas relief that one of them did, and a, a, a rare image of a semi-nude woman done by a woman in the early part of the 20th century. Um, I work, I've worked a lot with Michael Lex here, who was an out queer artist, although he doesn't foreground queer issues in his work a lot, but this was a show that I did for St. Mary's University Art Gallery before I was working there. I did this on contract, and the show is called Together by Circumstance, and this piece is uh, called Portrait of David, and he uh, put an ad in a newspaper in Winnipeg for men named David, and he has an image of a man named, a male named David of every age between one and uh, I think seven, in this installation it's 65, but I think it goes to 75. You can see here, um, actually it's uh, uh, 60, I think. So you can see age one and age 60 on the same corner here. Um, so uh, I, I would say there's a queer reading of, of Mike's work just in the way in which he, he makes us look at how men understand themselves, how men present themselves, what we understand a man to be uh, from this series of men who all have the same name. Um, in 2008, now working at the St. Mary's University Art Gallery, I did an exhibition uh, called Recuperation, which was ceramics produced by Leopold uh, L. Foulem, Leopold F. Foulem, who is um, uh, a, a queer uh, ceramist who grew up in Caracat, New Brunswick. He's Acadian ancestry, but lives in Montreal and taught ceramics for many years at Cégeps in Montreal and trained other ceramists um, who, who um, have uh, some of, there's a small group who are close socially and intellectually of, of queer Francophone ceramists who work in, in the vein that was kind of opened up by Leopold. Um, and his work is extremely dense and would a long time to tell you what's going on in all these pieces, but he's he's representing um, elements of many different periods of ceramic production, and it's often queer elements, uh, explicitly queer elements in this work. Here, for example, in the Heroes series, he's got images of Santa Claus based on a, a plastic piggy bank, and of Colonel Sanders, I uh, also a piggy bank, and of Blue Boy, and he is bringing them together in ways that suggest they might be gay couples. Um, uh, this is uh, just one image from a show I did at St. Mary's with Doug Guilford, who's a Nova Scotian-born queer artist working with uh, textile, and he was doing a lot of crocheting and producing of, um, of knitted and crocheted objects, which he's then places in landscapes. And some of these objects have lived underwater, under in, in seawater and in freshwater. Um, and some of them have gone back to those places. So they're, they're, they're marked by the processes of nature. Um, Doug was already well known as a printmaker before he did this work. Um, 2010, I was the Grand Marshal for Halifax Pride. Uh, this is me uh, in the Hillcrest Volkswagen car that they kindly provided. 
Um, and I'm jumping now to another show that had Leopold Fulan in it, but it was a three-person show called Campfires. Um, and I produced it for the Gardner Museum. And it was Leopold F. F, F Fulan, um, sorry, El, Leopold L. Fulan, I, um, his father, Leopold F. Fulan, and I have to keep the two of them straight. Leopold L. Fulan, who produced these um, uh, bicycle seats in the foreground, which have, have these uh, penises as parts of them. And uh, also works by Paul Mathieu and uh, Richard Millet. Uh, Paul and Richard studied under uh, Leopold. Paul now teaches ceramics at Emily Carr in Vancouver, and Richard works in Montreal and as an artist, and is also Leopold's husband. Um, this is Leopold. Um, and actually, Leopold is one of those homosexuals you can see from outer space. He um, he's a large man, and he always and he tends to wear bright, usually horizontal stripes, so he looks like a bumblebee a lot of the time. Um, and he and that's I see it as a, co a conscious choice of his to be very evident, very in your face as a queer uh, Acadian from a, from, a, from a fishing village in the Acadian Peninsula. Um, these are pieces by uh, his husband, uh, Richard Millet, which are based upon um, various fetish objects, the uh, coffee pot in the middle uh, uh, with the kind of studded, um, uh, it, it's kind of cock and balls kind of array. Um, and uh, things that are in kind of steel and black leather colors with steel studs, uh, representations of steel studs. And this is a uh, uh, an, an event early in the show, in the open for the opening of the show. The the people in this room are from the board of the uh, then board of the Canadian Lesbian and Gay Archives. And I and the three artists were all in town, and we're supposed to we were there for the official opening, and we're supposed to fly back on I think Thursday morning. And but we discovered on Wednesday that Thursday after evening the the Canadian Lesbian and Gay Archive board was going to have a supper fundraiser <laughs> at the, the museum, which the museum hadn't thought to tell us. Um, and some of the in this in this room are the three of them, the three men who were charged uh, uh, and the, as part of the body politic and uh, in the uh, censorship case where they all faced possible five year terms in prison uh, back in the 1970s. Um, so they're uh, all here represented as part of the group for the Canadian Lesbian Gay Archives, which grew out of the body politic. Um, and I'm going to go fairly quickly through what's left, but these are, I'd say these are some of the most important shows I've done. The Queer Looking Queer Acting, which I've gone through earlier, the Campfires exhibition. This is Migwidedemon, and I, sorry, Andrea, I should have coached you on the pronunciation of that. Migwidedemon means, do you remember in Mi'kmaq? And it can be either a question or a statement. And Ursula Johnson, who's an out queer uh, artist from Eskasoni um, in, uh, in Unamagi, Cape Breton, um, produced this work. Her uh, 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 great grandmother, um, uh, Caroline Gould, was an important basket maker. And on these cases, you can see representations of Caroline Gould's baskets, um, and they're labeled in Mi'kmaq. Um, and the, but the cases themselves are empty. The um, and for um, Ursula, this is a representation of, of what of the difficulty, the problematic of the uh, of the museum and how the museum has treated art from indigenous cultures and, and how it's encased them as artifacts. Um, uh, and so the emptiness there is about a number of ways in which meaning has been vacated, I think, from, from these objects. Uh, uh, Caroline Wool said to Ursula that as she, she was teaching Ursula traditional basket making techniques and uh, of which Caroline was a master. And uh, Caroline said that as people forget the, the, the how to make baskets, it's part of them forgetting the language because the language is, the language of, of the naming and the language of the making are one and the same thing. There is a word here, um, uh, uh, which I think is, uh, it's on one of these ones, I don't see right, uh, oh, there it is, I can read it backward here, but it's abidak batasik, which means, uh, very, very roughly, means something like you pull this out, turn it around and tuck it back in again. So essentially these words here are almost like a recipe. We, if you read these words in Mi'kmaq, they tell you how to make the object. And so it's about the intimate relationship between material culture and making and, and, and uh, doing and language. And that uh, if you stop the doing, you, uh, the, you also stop the saying, the speaking. Um, uh, so this was the uh, Grand Museological Hall where, where we see these empty vitrines. 
Um, and, um, and then in the side gallery, there were uh, these stands which were full of very objects made using traditional basket making techniques, but they were made wrong. They're all collectively called opal tech, which means it is not right in Mi'kmaq. And some of them have specific queer references, uh, uh, sees them as all being in some way queer, uh, like they're joined, two are joined together in the wrong way, you know, quote unquote wrong way, or the same basket has two openings at either end. Um, the visitors were welcome to put on these white gloves, pick up an object, bring it over to the table, and then scan the label that was attached to them. And they bring it would bring up a, a, a faux archive record, uh, like the kind that you'd see in museum, uh, in museum record keeping, which would give the stories about the objects, but the stories were basically invented. They, uh, Ursula had various kinds of parties, naming parties, where she'd invite people to come along and they'd make up stories about the objects, how they came to be and what they might be called. And then these made up stories became the official records about the objects. So it's a pastiche of the whole method whereby museums deal with um, indigenous objects. And it's a good example of how you can't separate out, in this case, uh, Ursula Johnson's uh, indigenous critique and her queer understanding as a two-spirited and queer person. Um, uh, the, those two are, are, are intimately connected to one another in the way that she imagines this exhibition. And this is from a panel that we did at the Mi'kmaq Native Friendship Center in Halifax um, uh, as part of it. So in community engagement, this show traveled right across Canada from BC to Newfoundland uh, and Labrador. And in each place, it was highly important that the local uh, galleries engage with Indigenous communities. Um, and in some cases, like in Lethbridge, we know that the the um, exhibition became, became, laid the foundation for an ongoing relationship between the gallery and the local Indigenous community. Um, and this, the um, Queer Lucky Queer, queer Acting was re-presented re in 2014. Uh, there's a book which uh, uh, is available, for, which is quite a substantial book and includes a lot of, uh, some of the history I've talked about. Um, uh, and uh, the uh, Kyber Center for the Arts presented it. And this is me and some of the people who worked together with me and to raise, put this on. And uh, we did a second edition of the catalog. If you look at my, at my image right now, this is the original catalog from the exhibition and it's 200 and it's 120 pages but we did a second edition which added 24 pages of new material and um, some of the people in this image uh, 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 like Beck here who is an artist and uh, um, uh, Genevieve Flavel um, uh, contributed at new essays for that part of it. I wanted the, ex the, the, um, new, the second edition catalog to include material from the last most recent decade decade of 2SLGBTQIA activism because um, uh, uh, to mark both the continuity and the really dramatic changes that have happened in the ways we talk and think about queer culture. And so here's some other images, uh, very different installation, uh, but you get a sense of, of the profusion of posters and materials in this case, and some of these are new ones as well. Uh, all the ones on the end ball here are much more recent ones that were contributed by, by some of the younger contributors. And I'm just about at the end. I wanted to give a shout out to Rebecca Rose. Um, uh, she and I are sharing a joke here and I'm holding the second edition of the catalog. Um, and Rebecca wrote a book a couple of years ago called um, uh, 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 before the parade, uh, which is a history of queer community activist community in uh, Nova Scotia uh, up and up bef until up before 1988 when the first Pride Parade happened in Halifax. And we are here at uh, the gala for the Nova Scotia Rainbow Action Project. And I just wanted to give a little shout out to my partner Wesley, who is watching. If he hasn't fallen asleep, hi Wesley. And uh, that's Laura Shepherd, who's an important um, uh, voice in the trans community behind us in a stunning for coat. And this is my last image, just uh, one of the last things I did in St. Mary's was I got a phone call, frantic phone call from a from a, uh, a, co a queer colleague who had just started working at the National Arts Center and they needed, to, they have this um, uh, Kipnis lantern where they can, they can um, project images and they needed something queer to put up and, and she was wondered if I had somebody to suggest and I suggested Joe Average who is a, a queer artist who designed coin uh, that was put out by Canadian Mint uh, a couple of years ago for the 50th anniversary of the partial decriminalization of homosexuality in Canada. Um, you may have seen, may remember that coin. I knew his imagery would reproduce well at a scale like this. It's very graphic and, and, and striking. And I was pleased to be able to pull a name out of my head uh, uh, so that they'd have somebody they could, they could program quickly. Unfortunately that, fortunately, that all came together very quickly. 
Um, I will just wrap up by saying that uh, I'm going to stop my share now and go back to just being me. Um, and uh, I will say that um, uh, I, um, at the end of uh, 2020, I um, uh, uh, retired from uh, St. Mary's University and um, uh, I I, uh, uh, I hadn't planned to retire that quick, that early, but uh, I'm 67. But I had planned to stay until I was 70. But after COVID, things became kind of in, impossible at uh, at that workplace, and so I took it as an occasion to retire. To, well, to retire, which is to stay to bail out. And I'm now living full time in the house that my mother built in Sheet Harbor Passage in Wagewick. And uh, one of the things I'm doing here, I'm still active as a curator, um, Lou Shepherd, who is a trans uh, artist who has, has been uh, shortlisted in the past for the Sylvie Art Award, the leading national art award in Canada, is, has been, uh, is opening an exhibition uh, on the 11th of February at St. Mary's University Art Gallery called Phase Variations. And Lou does a performance and uh, installation, a performance and, and sound-based installations drawn from data sets. For example, they've done, uh, he's done uh, um, scores that are drawn from melt glaciers. Well, the data set for this exhibition for face variations is the contents of my archives because over the last 46 years I've been collecting like, like crazy everything that I can lay my hands on that came out of the queer community and I have a substantial uh, uh, archives down here. So Lou is one of a number of um, uh, researchers who've been using it. Um, and so it's an example of the kind of engagement with um, contemporary uh, queer and trans artists that I'm doing now. And I'm developing my location here uh, under the working title of Passage Memory Project, I want to understand my archives here in a, in a non-traditional way, understanding what, that all the problems of the archives as colonial institutions um, and finding ways and uh, to create a space for open-ended space for uh, queer discourse um, uh, where books and art and music and friendship and food and uh, historical documents and the garden and land all interact with one another to create a space for understanding, sharing understandings of our history and our present and our possible futures. So I think with that, I will um, turn things over for uh, if there's any questions. Thank you.